Welcome. We are just going to give it a couple minutes to let everyone jump on the Zoom. Thanks for joining us today. I can see people still trickling in, so we'll just give it a couple more minutes. Welcome to our coffee this morning. Um, it looks like everyone's just about on, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Nina Newman. I'm the Associate Head of School for Advancement at King and also the Director of Admission and Financial Access. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to introduce to you our division heads. Um, we are a school of about 700 students um, and we have the resources of a big school. Um, and then we break down into these divisions that actually create almost small schools within um, the bigger context of the school, which we think is a really a wonderful component to King School. In fact, our upper school, um, which is our largest division, only has 380 students in it. So um, it's still um, considered a pretty small school. So we, we see it as the best of both worlds. And we're really looking forward to introducing you to those programs today. Um, I'm gonna ask each of the division heads to give you a little bit of an overview of their division, upper school, middle school, and lower school. And then we'll open it right up to questions so that you can make sure that the things that you're wondering about King School get answered during your time today. So with that, I will turn it over to Marnie Sedleski, who is our Associate Head of School for Program and also the Head of the Upper School. Marnie? Thanks, Nina. Um, team, can you hear me? My audio is working well. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for spending some time with us this morning to learn about what I believe is a very, very special place. This is my uh, 24th, 25th year. I started as a maternity leave sub, so we was a little give and take about when, what, if I'm 24 years here or 25 years here. But um, I'm very committed uh, to what I consider to be uh, just an amazing institution for many reasons, um, some of which I hope you get to hear about uh, today. Um, as Nina said, I am the associate head for program, which means I have the honor of focusing on a pre-K through 12 trajectory of programming. Um, and also uh, I'm currently serving as head of upper school and this is my uh, 15th year in, in that position. Um, but I wanna start with some overarching comments about the school before you hear from uh, Sandy and Josh and from me about, about our different divisional approaches to what is really an all school vision. Um, King is a school that is, as I say, quite nerdy about what works in education. We are thinkers. Uh, we hire teachers who are experts in their fields, disciplinarily speaking, for sure, but also in terms of how students learn. Uh, we deeply respect at King, um, no matter what age and stage you're at, that there is an age and stage that you're at, and that uh, professional educators, whether they're teaching um, second grade, seventh grade, 10th grade, whatever age group they're working with are deeply respectful of those developmental ages and stages. So that's one thing that we certainly are wildly committed to cross-divisionally. Um, how are we meeting the needs of our students and seeing them and understanding them for uh, who they are and where they're at developmentally? And uh, another thing that we share is just a genuine love for students for learning, for the learning student. Um, sometimes students who are learning can be very curious, even obstreperous, um, even, but, and challenging, and um, you know, are perhaps engaging with the world in ways that are completely appropriate for those ages and stages I was developing. How do you create atmospheric conditions in which students feel loved, seen, heard, known, and understood. Um, and that leads me to another comment, another thing we share cross-divisionally, and that is when students feel known, heard, loved, and understood, and valued for who they are, they are far more likely to engage in the intellectual rigors of a, what is a college preparatory education. Um, we say we educate for college and life. Most good schools do. We believe strongly that the atmospheric conditions um, to that day where you walk across the stage and get your diploma and go to the college university of your choice um, that that uh, feeling those atmospheric conditions deeply matter i am far more likely as a teenager for example to take risks taking a challenging course um, knowing how to advocate for myself as a learner if i feel 
that I am supported, known, heard, loved, and understood, okay? Um, the other thing you should know as you listen to us today is that we do share some essential questions as a school. Um, we believe that strongly in the liberal arts and sciences uh, as, as a framework that guides our curricular and programmatic choices here at King. And we orient ourselves around three questions. Who am I? Who are we? And how do I know what's true? That last question is, uh, I think, particularly apropos uh, as we, as a school, identify ourselves as a school very oriented to research and inquiry-based models of thinking. So um, we uh, understand deeply how students learn here at every age and stage. We care deeply about our learners and really appreciate them as human beings, as, as, pe as growing people in, in the world. And we uh, create programs that meet them where they're at, push them to their limits where they know they can take risks because they are known, heard, seen, loved, and understood. All in a context of rigorous uh, uh, college preparatory arts and sciences, liberal arts and sciences education that asks us, who am I, who are we, and how do I know what's true? Um, so with that, I will stop. And um, I'm wondering, Nina, if we should go to the lower school and, and build up so we can see how crucial the foundation is um, at King and the way that we think about um, the trajectory of a King experience. Is that okay? Okay. Sure. Sounds Sandy, good. take it away. Sandy. Fantastic. Thank you, Marnie. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is um, Dr. Sandy Lizia Duff. I am the head of the lower school. Um, I'm really excited that you are joining us today in considering King for your child. Um, our lower school program um, starts our students, they have PE every day. We have a course called Balance Blocks with our um, school psychologist, where the students learn how to um, re regulate their emotions. They learn about time management. They learn about various life skills. They also have art. They have music. They have computer science. Um, we believe that childhood is a time of exploration, wonder, and discovery. And so because of that, our pre-K -K program, it's based on a Reggio-inspired um, model. And Reggio is all about play. But play doesn't mean that your child is not learning. They are learning through play. I am a Reggio mom. I call myself a Reggio mom because from the time my daughter was four months old till she was five, she attended a Reggio program. And one of the things that I loved best was when she would come home or when I would pick her up and I would ask her, what did you do today? And she would say, mommy, I played and I played and I played. And that's all I wanted to hear. Not that she spent her day um, focusing on a workbook or a worksheet, but she was learning through play. And right now I am also a parent here at King. She is in the eighth grade and she continues to engage in inquiry-based learning um, atmosphere. And that is who we are through, um, through inquiry-based pre-K, -K, they're learning, they're playing. And in grades one through five, we, are, we continue that model using project-based learning. The children start using inquiry, they start to research a topic, and then they engage in the project aspect where they continue to immerse themselves into literature, into um, the work that they are learning about. And then as the mind, the brain, and the hands are working together, they are constructing a knowledge. And that is what we believe here at the lower school. We believe in teachers facilitating the learning process and children organically coming about the information. Certainly there are times when um, they're going to come across bumps and our teachers with their guiding hands, loving, nurturing and caring um, approaches to teaching, they help them. What I love best is that you will find a teacher when a child says, I don't know, or if they become frustrated, the teacher will say, let's think about it together. You will not find our lower school teachers giving answers, but they really focus on working with the children to help them think for themselves, to help them and give them the tools on how do you think, how do you figure out, how do you problem solve, how do you problem solve for yourself, whether it's a friendship situation or a math problem, 
or something, a story that you are working on, but let's think about it together. And that is what we do here at the lower school. It's really focusing on that entire child, engaging in them, engaging them in that learning process. Everything that we do here, and we do that as a team. We partner with our families as a team. Um, very often, if you reach out to us, uh, if something comes up, we will say to you, um, you know, this is something that perhaps the team um, needs to be involved in. And so sometimes it may be one on one, it's you and the teacher, but it may be that our school psychologist may need to be looked into it, because that is our approach. Um, and so I really do um, hope that you will take this time this morning to ask us about the lower school so that we can answer any questions that you have. Thank you. And now I will pass it over to my colleague because that is what I do. I pass the children on to him. And so Josh, take it away. All right, a little art imitating life, right? Um, so my name is Josh Deitch. I am the head of the middle school here at King. And again, I'll just echo what you've already heard here, which is thank you so much for coming. Um, and I'll also a lot of what, in terms of echoing, a lot of what I'm going to say this morning is gonna echo what you've already heard. This is the kind of the, the curse of going last in this crew and, and at a school like ours, where we do have such kind of strong through lines and strong themes that carry with our entire student experience that, a lot of what we do in the middle school is going to echo and sound a lot like and rhyme with what we do in the lower school. And it's in what a lot of what the upper school is gonna do is gonna echo and sound and rhyme a lot like what we do in the middle school because our goal is to provide our students with a consistent, thorough, meaningful experience that takes them from what we consider kind of the student to the scholar. And oftentimes when I talk about the idea of student, I'm thinking about someone who takes in information and learns to learn. And those are great things. But as a school, when we're talking about scholarship and scholarship, of course, looks different as a third grader, as a sixth grader, as an eighth grader, as an 11th grader, postgraduate, whatever scholarship might look like, it's exactly what we're talking about, especially around the conception of how do I know what is true is to kind of students go about learning to understand themselves, understand where they fit in the world and ultimately communicate something new and different and a novel understanding of whatever it is they might be studying. And again, that might not be so novel in our perspective as adults for you know a sixth grader telling us about some something they're studying right now, but it's gonna be novel to them and they're gonna increasingly develop this, a, a sophisticated way to communicate that understanding. So in our school, I could talk about this for a long time and I could talk about our middle school program for hours and, and I don't know if you wanna hang in uh, on a Zoom call for hours, probably not. And so what, we're, what I'm really gonna do is kind of give you a brief overview. One of the things that I'll talk about is our, our, our middle school is grade six through eight. And we really truly recognize that echoing what Marnie said about knowing our age and stage in these time, in this three years that we have our students in the middle school, they go through more change in their lives, socially, emotionally, cognitively, physically, than almost any other time in their life, except from when they're born to when they're three years old. And so the, the, the faculty that we have who come in and teach our children teach our middle schoolers first. They are middle school teachers who know this age group and know these kids really well. And they're content area experts, exactly like Marnie said. So not just are they, do they not, not just do they understand our kids and are they kid experts and know these kids, but they understand what it means to teach science to a middle school student. They know that when we start talking about the Krebs cycle in seventh grade biology, here are the opportunities that students are gonna really understand. And here are the common misconceptions that we could already start to play around with. And to make sure that our students are asking meaningful and thoughtful questions. And so we build a program that we really have these really essential beliefs of what a student needs to have a good foundational understanding of in terms of your writing, your reading, your arithmetic. And at the same time, we built it off of these other three R's, which are uh, relationships, re uh, richness, and relevance. Um, our teachers build strong relationships with our kids. They know who our students are on an individual basis. We focus our entire educational experience on the student experience. This doesn't mean that an individual student might come in one year and say like, you know what, I've decided I'm not gonna do math. Um, but it does mean that 
we are going to build a middle school program that is responsive to our students' interests, that is allowing them to figure out what they are passionate about, that gives them a wide range of experiences so that as they move through our middle school, they have a good sense of what paths they wanna take and what they wanna follow next as they head into the upper school that will allow them to have even more choice and more individuation while at the same time working within our system. Um, we also really believe in building a curriculum and a program that is rich, right? Having a student being able to dive deep into different topics and areas. Yes, there's gonna be the, the kind of metaphor I, get, I always think about is that, um, our, a lot of our barriers to entry have low floors, but very high ceilings. Our students can jump in at their readiness level, and then they can dive into whatever they want to do. And they're going to show their understanding and show what they're talking about and show what they know in an increasingly complex and sophisticated way all through their time with us in middle school, and then be very well prepared for what they're going to have to do as they move on into the upper school. And then the last thing I think that, that can be sometimes the most important aspect of our program is the concept of relevance, right? So much as our middle schoolers are figuring out who they are, and, and sometimes you can think about if, you, if any of you have middle schoolers on, on the call right now or just about to have our young adolescents that are middle schoolers, you can probably be like, yeah, sometimes they're, they, they're this moment in time where they're, they're going to challenge us in some ways. And oftentimes the question we're going to hear a little bit from middle schoolers is like, you know, why are we learning this? Why does this matter? And we build a curriculum that allows them to see not just what they're learning, but why they're learning is so important and the significance of what they're learning. And it allows them a window into the opportunity to figure out based on what I know, how do I fit into the world around me? And how do I impact the world around me? And that all comes back to those essential questions of who am I, who are we? And uh, how do I know what is true? Because we are giving them all the tools they need to kind of answer those questions without never ever actually saying, here's what these, the answers to these questions are, because that's the kind of nature of an essential question. That's the nature of a liberal arts education, which allows us to keep asking, keep learning, and keep refining our own understandings because we really recognize as a school that our learning and our curriculum and our work as educators and educatees, if that's a word, is never done. Um, and, and so that we're always going to continue to grow and learn and, and develop. So with that, that, that's a really broad overview of what we do as a middle school. Um, and I will kind of stop talking and I think I'm passing it back to Nina because we've heard from my other two colleagues. Yeah, I just wanted to give a few quick, if, Josh, if it's okay, I just wanted to jump in and throw in a few uh, upper school specific comments um, based on what you just said, Josh. Um, it, it, everything that Josh said, everything that Sandy said, as both of them recognize, resonate um, through the King experience through 12th grade. By the time students come to us in the, in the upper school, um, and even if they enter as ninth and sometimes 10th graders, right, from other uh, school communities, I know there are some prospective families on the call who have not been a part of our lower middle Middle schools, but we'll be entering the high school um, as a standalone experience. Um, is certainly the spirit of what my colleagues and uh, have described um, is very powerful in our upper school. By the time kids get to the upper school, they are encouraged to continue to explore and deepen their interests. Um, as they move from student to scholar, they are deepening their scholarship skills. They are learning to become um, really focused in certain areas that are, are, are of passion to them, all supported by that core strong curriculum of a, a liberal arts and science education. Um, in the upper school, we do have some signature programs, which surely you can ask about, or if you want to learn more about, can you can pursue in another context. But our students are, um, I, I think, uh, really lucky in that no two student high school upper school schedules are the same. We have an amazing set of electives in the upper school that um, help students tease out those interests, pursue those passions, try new things. Uh, we have distinction programs, diploma distinction programs in global studies, in STEM, in the visual arts, in leadership, and in world languages. We also have an Aspire Advanced Science Research Program here at King and a main humanities fellowship uh, research program uh, in the humanities. Uh, and uh, many, many other signature programs that uh, exist because we believe that students need at this age, at the upper school age and stage uh, to really develop those interests and take themselves very seriously as young scholars and um, researchers. We also start our college counseling program in our ninth grade here. The team approach that Sandy mentioned that we have in the lower school, we have in the upper school as well. And a member of that team starting right in the ninth grade is a college counselor who stays with you and works with you and gets to know you deeply as a part of the 
process because of course, commencement, which is about to happen at King, uh, we're very excited in person this year. Um, the word commencement means to begin to begin again, right? So by the time kids graduate from King, they are ready, ready to begin again at the next stage of their journey um, with power and uh, with grace and um, really with confidence. That's that's our, our hope for our uh, seniors, of course. Um, so that, that was my little upper school spiel, Nina, sorry to jump in there again. <laughs> No, that was great. I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about college counseling. So that was perfect. Um, at this time, I would like to encourage people to go ahead and put questions in the Q&A box. Um, and I will make sure that the um, questions get answered. That is the little feature down at the bottom that says Q&A. Um, you can enter them right in there. And then I will ask um, the right division head. Um, I think one of the questions we always get that we might as well just kick off with is about homework levels. How much homework do we get? Um, and maybe Sandy, you could start us in the lower school and we'll move up um, through the divisions. Um, how do we sort of think about homework? Um, because it does vary, obviously, kids work at different paces, they take different classes. <laughs> um, but how does that work in the lower school? How do you take, think about homework? Sure, absolutely. So homework for us, it's a reinforcement of what's taking place in the classroom because we really want the children to go home and practice those skills. Um, we believe in quality time with families. And so we want the children to engage in meaningful work. Um, and so the homework, certainly it's, it's going to look different for each child. The homework may take one student 20 minutes um, to complete, whereas depending on the learning style, depending on the a particular student, that same homework may take another child 30 minutes. It may take another child 45 minutes. So it's very um, difficult to really put a number in terms of time um, for, for students because they vary in terms of learning. But the typical, the average um, time for completing homework in grades one, one to three is 20 to 30 minutes. In grades four to five, because the homework gets a little bit much more com um, complicated and much more sophisticated, it, the average is about 45 minutes to an hour. But again, keeping in mind, um, each child is different. And that homework, it could, it's going to look very different. It could be, um, again, because of the earlier grades, it could be um, a game that they're playing. Certainly it's um, homework, it's going to be social studies, it's going to be reading, it's going to be writing, um, there's math. Uh, reading, we do not count that as homework. And so if they're reading from their book baggie, that's really um, an appreciation. It's to gain an appreciation for reading, for literature. It's to build stamina. It's to um, spend time together as a family. So that time that your child is spending reading, that's not counted as homework, but everything else, certainly that's homework. So we do ask that you keep that in mind. Josh? Yeah, thanks, Sandy. I think what you heard from Sandy is going to sound a little similar again, what we do in the middle school, and then it, it, it kind of bumps up in complexity. One of the things that I would say uh, in the middle school that we truly believe in is the concept of homework. What we don't believe in is the concept of busy work. And so um, we we really do believe that our, our homework follows the philosophy of exactly what Sandy said. It's reinforcement, it's practice, it's, re it's, it's, it's application, and it's also um, sometimes preparation for the following day and the following day's lesson. And um, in the middle school, as students kind of individuate into their own separate classes, as opposed to having teachers who more, more are more tend to spending, the, who, having students who spend more the, the, the full day with, excuse me, one or two teachers, they have, you know, one teacher for each class. We aim for about 20 minutes of homework per class per night over the course of their time with middle schoolers. That said, um, the way that homework starts to build on itself is really important because as we are developing our students um, and as they develop through our program, the goal is to use homework not just as um, a content reinforcement tool or, or an application practice tool for the skills learned in class, but also as an opportunity for students to continue to uh, practice 
taking responsibility and owning their learning. And so a lot of our homework is devoted to helping them with their time management skills, with their materials management skills, with their uh, self-advocacy skills, because so much of our homework is also about what do you do when you don't know something? What do you do? How do you reach out for help when you feel like you've reached an impasse? Do you just throw up your hands and say, I can't do it? Or do you have a, a, a toolbox in place that allows you to sit down and write an email to a teacher and say, I, I, I reached a point tonight. I couldn't figure out this one math problem. Can we sit down and meet tomorrow or the next day? Um, and so a lot of what our homework is designed to do in middle school is especially move from kind of the model of one assignment per night per class to the model of we're going to give you some longer term assignments. We're going to give you some kind of begin date, middle date, end dates. And now we're going to work with you and scaffold your understanding so that by the time you leave our middle school experience, give or take, you will have the ability to know when I get a, a, an assignment that starts today and is due a week and a half from today, how do I structure my time so that when I sit down to do it, I'm not like sitting down Tuesday night on something that was due Wednesday, but assigned a month ago and realizing I have three hours of homework. And that takes time, that takes energy, that takes teacher intervention, that takes uh, parent and, and family support. But that is the ultimate goal that our students come away from this experience with homework, feeling really capable and confident and understanding their own kind of skills and strategies that work the best for them. Uh, and I'm sure the upper school probably picks up on that and, and with, for, with Marnie. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Josh. So you've all heard now that homework can be used for muscle building, building those muscle memories, uh, those strong skill sets um, throughout the lower and middle school years, and also contributing uh, to practice, but then also time management, understanding yourself as a learner, helping uh, uh, build those self-advocacy skills. Uh, all of that uh, continues in the upper school. And in fact, in the upper school, we, we do use the word homework, but we encourage the kids to think about their studies. They're studying, they're learning, they're practicing, because a lot of times the work that they're doing outside of a traditional classroom, which is quite a bit of work, and we can talk about clubs and our academic clubs later, uh, which are very, very highly rigorous activities that aren't happening in a traditional classroom setting. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. But homework is really about studying. It's about what you are doing with your studies and your commitments. And that can happen during the day and not at home. By the time you're in the high school and indeed beginning in the middle school, so you have practice, we do have study halls. And we encourage students to see their days as as opportunities to carve out, again, this time management skill, right? To carve out what they can accomplish in their day and to look at their day as like a part of their life and a part of the goals that they're setting for themselves. So I'm going to schedule in um, you know, a meeting with my math teacher, or I'm going to go down to the math help center, or I'm going to go see my English teacher about a writing project that I'm working on. But I'm also gonna check in with my model UN instructor um, so that I can work on my position paper. And I'm gonna check out a study hall because all ninth graders take study halls. I'm gonna check out of my uh, study hall to um, go meet with my college counselor or to work on a group project that I have permission to go work on. Um, in an, in an empty classroom or a workspace and or in the innovation lab. So I, I, I think homework in the upper school um, is, well, sometimes kids will say, I have a lot of homework. What they're really talking about is that they're engaged in a lot of different studies that they're pursuing and activities that they're pursuing and sports that are, are happening after school or performing arts or um, you know art colloquia or things that they're doing um, to participate in our wonderfully rich program that require the time management. And some of that work has to happen outside of school at home. And some of that happens right here in the class, in the classroom, outside of the classroom, in study halls, and with our teachers at help centers. So I tried to give a, a sort of broader gloss on the question there, um, just to, to touch a little bit on the upper school's um, thinking about classwork and outside of classwork. Great, thank you. Um, there's a wonderful question about student life extracurricular offerings at King, especially for those who might not be sporty. Um, and, and you're speaking our language because we really, there isn't a cookie cutter kid at King. We don't look for one type of kid um, who's going to um, do the same kinds of things as everyone else. We love that our kids have different interests. Um, so I thought maybe we could quickly go through each division again, um, and I'll, we'll start with Sandy again to keep that circle up um, about sort of 
some of the, the ways in which we tap into um, our kids' interests beyond athletics, because we do have a very strong athletic program, but this question's about the other interests. Absolutely. Um, as you've heard, we do believe in well-roundedness. Um, and so we have a program called King Cares, which is very much aligned with our mission and our values. Um, and so it's really um, thinking about how can you be a good citizen? And so service learning, it's tied into one of our pillars, um, service learning. And so the children have an opportunity to, um, year round to be a member of our King Cares um, program. And that's, um, that's run by, uh, all of our programs are run by a faculty member. We also have our eco club. And that, um, again, when we think about sustainability, when we think about the environment, when we think about gardening, that's another opportunity um, for the children to be engaged and involved at the end of the day. Yoga is um, another opportunity. Again, um, you know, just thinking about the, the self, um, just another, when you think of different ways to express yourself, different ways to think introspectively, um, just how can we continue the work that we do, um, mindfulness, which is part of our curriculum, but extending it to after school, providing children with the tools that they need to regulate their emotions without always needing an adult to guide them. And so we extend that also throughout after school activities. Martial arts um, is another um, discipline that we offer. There's acting, there's all kinds of movements. We also offer chess, we offer scratch, we offer engineering. And so there are lots of opportunities for the, the children who are not sporty. And even if you are sporty, it's okay to do both. Um, it's okay for you to play golf. It's okay for you to play basketball, um, soccer, and everything else and still be a part of the design group, scratch, engineering, and sculpture, um, because we do want our children to have that balanced approach to learning um, here at King. Josh? Yeah, I think, thank you, Sandy. I think that's that, that last part of what you're saying, I think is really important to stress, which is, um, you know, what, I think one of the things that we think about when we talk about the concept of extracurricular uh, activities is that there's very few things in our middle school or in our school experience that are considered as extra. We see a lot of the things that at a pre, at a, you know, at other schools might be seen as extra things like arts and music and performing arts and athletics, those are our extracurriculars. In, in, at King, we see them as co-curricular. We see them as things that are essential to the development of our students and their development of, of their understanding of self and, and their understanding of where they fit in the community. And so a lot of those experiences that they have in the lower school get again echoed in the middle school and are built into our middle school curriculum. So students have the opportunity to every year do visual arts, to do performing arts, um, to do a level of computer science and design classes. Those are all built into the student experience already. And then on top of that, just like in the lower school, we have student led clubs. And these this is where, again, our opportunity for students to develop their voice and sense of self really comes through because our students take on the roles of club leaders. They design what's happening on a, a you know every other week basis for their peers. Um, even in COVID this year, we've had things ranging from a debate club to a video game club to a King Cares Club, just like Sandy said, which was again, designed for our students to connect to each other and connect to others in our community and even outside of our community in a variety of different ways. We have really wonderful partnerships with local communities like the Boys and Girls Club, which in most years were able to go directly there and offer our students and our students offer their level of support and connection and caring. Our seventh grade curriculum is very much devoted to the concept of service and service learning Again, not extra, but directly baked into our, our, our student curriculum. And then the last thing I would say is in the middle school, because we see these things as so connected and so curricular, um, the athletics program is a part of our student school day. And I would say very clearly that, and I'm going to channel our Dean of Athletics, Micah, Halbin, who is uh, currently has two students in the middle school, he says very clearly, his older, um, very aligned with the concept of um, team sports, younger, not so much. 
And at the same time, they both have found their place in our middle school athletics program. For those who really are precocious and want to play for a school team and are excited to uh, compete across schools, there, there's a spot for them. And for those who are a little less so, want to try a little bit of things out, want to do some things differently, plan a different team every season for the nine seasons that they're in middle school. There's a place for them too. And if they're really not down with the team sports side of things, we also have things like yoga and strength and conditioning that allow them to continue to explore the concepts of healthy decision-making and, and lifelong fitness. And then the last thing I'll just plug is we have a wonderful performing arts program um, that is culminating right now for our middle schoolers who after everything else is going on, some of our students have opted into doing a COVID production of, of um, you know, some form of production that they are going to be doing uh, tomorrow night, Thursday night, and Friday night over Zoom. Uh, lots of monologues and two or three person scenes, um, but they've been just, it, it's a wonderful experience for our students. And, and that every single student really has the opportunity to do this in a lot of ways. Our performing arts, that side of things, it tends to be voluntary, but we, we continue to build a program that allows them to choose as they go through that program as well to find their passions, passions and interests. Yeah, the, um, the only thing I would add to what Josh said is that in the upper school, as kids individuate from you as parents and um, need to continue because it's their developmental objective, right? That is what the body does. It's what, <laughs> what humans do. They separate from their parents and become their own people. Um, there's a really uh, lovely dovetailing with uh, the student-led clubs that Josh was mentioning. Um, we also have a lot of clubs that fall under the category of what we call personal clubs, um, where the kids are actually engaging personally with particular um, issues that there are important to them, but also that are central to their identity. So it, in addition to our wildly popular clubs like Model United Nations, our investment club is hugely popular, our debate team is very successful, our math team is wildly successful. In addition to those more traditional clubs in the academic realm, we have affinity groups. We have a, an affinity group for students of color, for or, um, our LGBTQIA plus group. We have a, a, a gender spectrum alliance affinity group. We have um, a student who's current, uh, currently leading a civil rights club. Um, we have groups of kids who are starting newspapers who are writing for a newspaper that was started here in like 1910. Um, <laughs> so called the standard. Um, we have kids working on yearbook um, and are working to make sure the thematic content of our yearbook reflects the diversity of our community and the complexities of the world around us. Um, you heard us talk about the liberal arts and sciences earlier. Um, the who am I and who are we questions are, and how do I know what's true questions um, are, are central to any excellent education. And certainly we do not shy away from tough conversations about what it means to be human. Certainly in the high school, it's the developmental stage that the ch children are at. Who am I? is one of the most important questions and who are we is intimately related. How do we uh, embrace the world with our eyes wide open and learn as much as we possibly can about the self and the other and engage meaningfully um, in those conversations without fear um, and uh, with confidence. So I think our clubs program is, you know, again, I, I love our athletics program as well and I don't see them as, as necessarily separate but we've got lots of opportunities um, for kids to explore um, and grow and learn in our clubs program. Great segue, um, because we have a couple questions about diversity and I thought I would kick it off and then let our division heads weigh in um, as, as they see fit. Um, so diversity at King, um, we include um, all different types of diversity, racial diversity, um, certainly um, gender, socioeconomic diversity, geographic diversity. Um, a few sort of statistics for you is 24% of our students identify as students of color. Um, we have um, in each division, we have 65 um, flags hanging that represent the countries of origin of our um, students, their parents, or our 
staff and faculty uh, and their families. Um, we have a fabulous global education program um, that really dovetails nicely with our um, international population. Um, there's specifically a question about um, bilingual backgrounds. Um, we definitely have a number of students who are bilingual, um, some of which um, participate in um, the their um, native languages at school and some of which decide to take advantage of our world offerings um, to try new languages so it really depends on what the family is looking for and sort of how much um, how fluent the child how bilingual the child is i guess um, whether they um, would find those classes robust enough for them um, so that's something we could work on individually with you Marnie listed off a lot of the clubs that we have um, that um, help our students um, address their own um, interest in diversity. And I guess I just want to say that at King, we really put diversity with equity and inclusion and see them as um, important components to a bigger program. We don't just want a um, diverse student body or a diverse faculty. We want it to be equitable and we want um, inclusion. Um, we have been doing a lot of work in all of those areas. Um, we do it um, socio-emotionally as appropriate, pre-K all the way up through 12. Um, and we do it in our curriculum too, to make sure that our students are really getting um, a well-balanced education. Division heads, is there anything specifically you wanted to add about what you're doing in your divisions? Sandy, I see you nodding sure. your head. <laughs> uh, so in terms of bilingual children, what we um, the at the lower school, our world language program, the children, um, they're learning how to speak Spanish. And it's not just Spanish. One of the um, things that we do, which I really appreciate how Senora Santander teaches Spanish, is that we do take a global um, approach to teaching it. So she's not just teaching the language, but she also teaches um, the children about the culture, the countries, the geography, the people of where the language is spoken. Um, and for the children who are bilingual, she also, um, she, for all of the children, she incorporates literacy. And so there's the conversational piece. And so they're learning that as well. And so similar to our um, classrooms where the children are assessed in terms of their English literacy and their levels, she does the same. We have a similar um, benchmark assessment that she admits ministers, and she does that in Spanish uh, to see what are their um, fluency, their reading levels in Spanish. And so based on that, she's able to determine and assign them reading um, books that they can read at their level. And we also differentiate the, um, the books that the children will use. And so um, currently all of our students, if all of them are using level A, but a native um, speaker, we will accommodate and that child may um, similar, they're learning the same skills, same concept, but at another level. And so they may be using, let's say book C or book D. Um, so that's very important to us here at King to make sure that um, each child is receiving what they need. Um, in terms of the overall work that we do around diversity, equity, and inclusion, we do, um, we have enhanced our program, our racial literacy program. Um, all of our teachers have been engaging in in-depth um, training. We have been working with a consultant, a couple of consultants um, since the summer to really focus on in terms of how, um, using nonfiction and fiction books um, primarily as primary sources and also historical documents for learning about how um, race is socialized, socialized, but in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, again, it's grounded in our um, mission. It is grounded in our values here at King. When we think about um, honesty, perseverance, integrity, and respect. Um, those are very important to us. And so everything that we do when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and when we're um, teaching children what it means to be kind, what does empathy means when we're talking and learning about um, other people, it's not just learning about others, but it's learning with them. And our global studies program, we really take that perspective of learning with 
um, with other people and not just learning about other people. And so our goal is to create that inclusive community um, and where we are learning different perspectives. And when we do come across a perspective that we do not share, that we do not um, agree on, but we still engage in a respectful conversation and how do we teach children to do that? Um, and how do we engage in you know, the larger world, not just the self, not just our King community, but um, the entire um, larger community when it comes to race, ethnicity and culture. Josh, um, Marnie. Yeah. Yeah, did anyone want to add in to that comprehensive answer? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to add the only thing. I'll, no, that's perfect <laughs> no, because right, I don't think I have awesome. to add too much to that. But the thing I would say is that the way it progresses in the middle school, first, I will say, you know, for students who do come in with bilingual background, a lot what Nina said is exactly right. And a lot what Sandy said is exactly right. What we actually have is a program that is designed for a student to come in and, and, and then I'll speak as, as a native English speaker, right? I still really benefited from my English classes as I learned more about the grammar and vocabulary and things like that. So it's designed for students to continue to develop the sophistication and complexity in all forms of literacy that appear in a language, not just the spoken and the, 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 the listening, but also the reading and the writing side of things. Um, in terms of that, I also think one of the things that for middle school that echoes so much what Sandy said is the con is the conception of literacy. And um, when we talk about literacy, we often kind of in a school go right to uh, speaking, uh, sorry, writing and reading, right? But there's a, a one of our one of our core literacies in the middle school is also this concept of a multicultural racial literacy, understanding that um, there are different experiences in the world and there are there are different experiences that I bring to the table and, and being able to be literate in having conversations in exploring these without necessarily falling into certain traps or misconceptions or generalizations is so important to our students development, um, especially as we kind of think about who am I, who are we, how do I know what's true, right? It boils down to the idea of li being literate about yourself, being literate about other people's experiences and also having a, a complexity of, of media literacy as well. How do I get all this information that is bombarding our, our, our young adolescents at this time and make out an understanding of how do I determine what is the right and most important and truthful way to communicate this understanding? And along those same lines that's built into kind of every aspect of our community, we also have programming like the upper schools already talked about in terms of affinity groups and um, certain clubs that are devoted to helping students make sense of this in either groups of like-minded or maybe unlike-minded friends and, and peers and colleagues to make sure that they are finding communities within their communities, whether it's through advisory, whether it is through our, our students of color affinity group our, or our affinity group that's for uh, LGBTQ plus folks and allies um, or our Jewish student union. Those are the three that we primary ones that we have right now with more potentially in the works um, or, you know, those are those are the areas that our students have the opportunity outside of the core curriculum to continue to make sense of not only their experience at King, but also the world around them. Yeah, the only thing I would add uh, to that very full um, exploration of the questions, Nina, would be our parents association kind group um, that we have a very active parents association here at King in all aspects of, of our school life. Um, just to, we have a phrase called partnering with parents. It's what we do here, um, PWP. So it's, a, we are a day school. We are not a boarding school. We uh, believe very strongly in the day school model that when you are a day school, you are a community school and you partner with families. Um, and our, our, Parents Kind Committee of our Parents Association is actively involved in um, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion here at King and are, are very proud to partner with the school at different divisions uh, for age-appropriate programming, but also just to offer spaces for parents to get together and talk um, about their own experience as community members at King as we seek to be an inclusive and equitable parent community. Um, how are we all taking care of each other and how are we all meeting each other uh, where we're at? And so I just wanted to throw that out as an institutional reality. Our Parents Association at King is an, is an ancient institution. I mean, it was 
the school was founded in the late 19th century. So obviously it's taken very, very, very many forms, but its current iteration is a really robust one. Um, so those of you who are on this call who are asking about parent connections and parent opportunities in the area of diversity, there was specifically a question about uh, parent community. Um, I would point you to our parents association. And I'm embarrassed to say I'm I'm drawing a blank on what kind stands for Marnie. I, I know the king is yeah you can I, I, I knew you were going to ask me that and I think <laughs> teens the acronym at one point and I have to tell you I, I don't know. that will have to get back to everyone on that committee one. <laughs> of our parents association yeah. um, that is committed to diversity equity and inclusion um, and 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 I'll do my homework on yeah, um, too, on what really. the IND stands. What happens for. when you're around for too long and you just sort of let it become a part of your vocabulary? And, I know, yeah. I know, that's good. Yeah. Great. Our last question is about transitioning to King, and it's specifically about the upper school. But I guess I would just want to answer it broadly for the entire. Yeah. every audience today because um, we are a school that grows. We start um, with uh, 16 kids in our pre-K program um, and we add into each grade as um, as they go up through the years. Certainly sixth grade is another very big um, entry point and ninth grade is another very big entry point. Um, but even in those sort of odd years, we often will take four to six sometimes even 10 students in those years. Um, and so um, it's really wonderful because our kids are used to um, welcoming new classmates in at every stage of the game. Um, and so this isn't a school where we've had all of the same students together since kindergarten, and now all of a sudden we're adding someone in in seventh grade or 10th grade. Um, part of the transition starts in the admission process, um, certainly um, making sure that you have all the information that you need about King, but also making sure that it's the right fit um, and making sure that your child is ready to flourish at King and to make sure that you are ready to partner with us at King is um, the division heads have shared with you that's an important component to a successful um, match is that the, the parents and the school are all on the same page. Um, we do orientations um, at the beginning of the school year. Um, which is great. Um, and that's a sort of a nice way for our students to get to know the lay of the land. Um, we do placement tests as needed um, in the middle school and upper school. Um, those take place in the spring and they're generally for math and world languages um, to make sure that students are entering in at the right time period. Um, and we do have different opportunities for both students and families to get to know members of the community all along the way um, to make sure that um, you are not sort of starting fresh on day one. Um, by the time the first day of school rolls around, you have a pretty good sense of who we are and we have a pretty good sense of who you are. Um, I would just add in that um, we do parent teacher conferences in the fall and that's a nice opportunity for um, the parents to connect with the teachers and make sure that you are sort of proper transitioned as well. Um, it's important that the students feel that way, but it's also important that you feel a part of the community um, and knowing what is going on there. Um, Marnie, did you want to add a couple things to that transition? Yeah, I, I think um, just to address the specific nature of the upper school transition, I mean, obviously, we know our students are coming to us in, in ninth and, and some in 10th grade as well um, from different experiences. Um, they're moving from other areas of the country, they're um, switching types of schools, um, and we are we have a really robust uh, transition approach in the upper school that not only deals with the social emotional needs that students have. We know teenagers are going to worry about who they're going to sit with at lunch and who their friends are going to be and who's in their advisory groups before they worry about you know which calculus class they're attending. So it uh, that we uh, we definitely attend to those pieces, but because we have this developmental developmental model for college counseling, where you're assigned a, a college counselor right away. Um, when you come in new to the upper school, you get assigned to that person. Plus you work with a, a wonderful human being named Ted Parker, who's our academic dean here in the high school. And he's really experienced teams with uh, the college uh, folks to meet with you and directly with your child to select classes to hit the ground running to make sure we have um, as much knowledge of about who you are and who your child is and what your hopes and dreams are as, as a family and what your child's hopes and dreams are so that um, we can uh, really make sure that we transition your child um, into the academic and 
cultural, a club, arts, athletics fabric of the school as quickly as possible. And then we do have a uh, class meetings that are separate from our all school assemblies that specifically welcome our new students, um, including uh, trips before COVID. We, the ninth grade would go to Boston and we do a lot of group building. Um, some of our, we still do group building, but we, uh, we did it differently this year. Um, and we look forward to being able to take our kids off campus because we do believe that um, helping kids transition is welcoming everyone in, right? And, and uh, getting them into an experience that they're all experiencing as, as being new. So uh, we do have a lot of, of transitional elements uh, to our upper school by design and um, certainly happy to answer more specifics that that particular family um, might need uh, Nina if, if they come up later. Great We're, we are out of time. I did want to just say that the kind um, acronym was much easier than we thought it was King inclusion and diversity. So the N I think is what was throwing us and it is um, actually to stand for and um, so that is what that parent committee is um, if you did not get your questions answered today please please call the admission office we would love an opportunity to get to know your family um, we start this parent partnering um, in the admission process and we really love having those opportunities to connect to you um, so please reach out to us and let us help you um, get to know king and um, figure out if we're the, the right place for you and your family um, thank you to the division heads john Josh and Marnie and Sandy, um, you were great as always. And um, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Thanks, everyone. Right, Take thank care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good day.